one way of looking at software development is that there are two different types of work. The stuff that's really our goal, solving the problems that our users need to be solved, and the stuff that it takes to make good systems. People often talk of the second group of things in planning terms as technical stories. Now clearly, I'm not going to say that these things don't matter. They're vital to success. But how do we approach these technical tasks? They're important, but often tend to get overlooked and under-prioritised in planning. And teams and systems suffer as a result. So why are technical stories a bad idea? And if they are, what are the alternatives? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. And if you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Equal Experts, Octopus, Tricentis and Transfic. They're great supporters of our channel, so please do support them in turn by checking out their links in the descriptions below. BDD Star acceptance testing is a collaborative process. It needs input from people who are experts in the problem that we're trying to solve. People who have a vision for where our product should go and the people who know how to make those products. I've just released three new training courses aimed at each of these groups. They explore how to write great user stories and from them great acceptance tests that will remain true even as your system changes and better communicate the needs of the, that system to development teams. The technical version of the course goes on to teach you how to make these executable specifications in the form of acceptance tests really work, with clear examples that demonstrate how to eliminate intermittency, build tests that are fast, efficient, repeatable and reliable, and make tests that are easy to write and easy to maintain. This is a powerful technique for establishing a fast, high quality approach to development. The courses are all, are all out now, so please do take a look for you and maybe for some of your less technical colleagues. Creating software systems is a technical discipline. There are many technical aspects that matter hugely to the success of the endeavour. No one builds a great system by ignoring these things. We technologists are experts in this part of the problem, not usually the orgs that employ us or the managers that organise and prioritise the work though. Even when the orgs that employ us are expert in technology, if we're working on something, we are closer to it to, uh, and to do good work, we need to take responsibility for it. So why do so many teams defer to non-technical people when it comes to technical decision making? As I said in the intro to this episode, there are clearly two important dimensions to writing software, the problem that we're solving and the technicalities of solving it. Another way of looking at this is the essential complexity of the problem and the accidental complexity that we add to it necessarily as a result of us solving the problem with computers. There's no way of getting away from the essential complexity. If we're employed as professional software developers, developers, then this is really what we're employed for, to find solutions to problems that are of value in some way. The essential complexity is how we calculate tax when we sell things, or how to respond to turbulence in an automated flight control system. It's the stuff that the users of our software use it for. The accidental complexity is something else altogether. It's a kind of side effect, a consequence of addressing the problem with a computer and its surrounding technology. But that doesn't mean that it isn't important. If we're using computers, we need to collect inputs and deliver outputs in some way. Our design choices of how we do that, how it looks, how it works, and the tech that we use to do it are all accidental complexity. The design of our user interfaces, our APIs, the display of our results, the act of persisting them or distributing them so that they are available more quickly or more resilient in the face of failure are all accidental complexities too. None of these things are unimportant or trivial, but they aren't directly about solving the problem. A simple view of the ideal most efficient way to design software 
is to maximize our ability to focus on the essential complexity and work to minimize the impact of the accidental complexity. This is kind of okay as a guideline, but it's a lot more subtle than that and nowhere near enough. If you follow this advice too closely, you will end up with a very bad mess. Systems that are unmaintainable and that grind to a halt under the weight of their own technical debt. The problem is that we are building systems that run on computers and we need to worry about the technicalities of that and how they intrude on our solutions. As an aside, I think it's generally a good idea, a rule of thumb design strategy to aim to separate the code that deals with the essential and accidental complexities. This is a kind of approximate sideways take on what domain driven design is all about. So how do we plan for these two different types of work that are both part of our job? The obvious and very common approach is to separate these two parts of our jobs. We create user stories to define one and technical stories to define the other. Let's start by focusing on new work. I'll come back to dealing with addressing tech debt later. This is an obvious strategy, but actually it's a really bad idea. Most of us don't use the terms essential and accidental complexity every day. And I would advise that you try to avoid them in conversations with non-technical people. But even so, I think that they are so accurately capture the reality that they creep into how people think about and plan software development anyway. You can picture a bad non-technical manager thinking, we're on a deadline, don't work on any of the accidental stuff, just focus on the essential. This is nonsense and an approach that, as I already said, will kill your project if you follow it. But some version of it is also very common. In Agile development, our aim is to focus on user value. We capture requirements as user stories that express user needs, and we prioritize our work based on what's of most value to our users. If we split our stories into user stories and technical stories, then surely we must now prioritize the user stories, given our goal for aiming for increasing user value. We'll be fine. We'll get back to the technical stories later, we may think. Anyone who's worked in software for any amount of time will recognize this decision and will have seen the choice being made. It results in low quality systems that are hard or almost impossible to maintain. Changes to the code get more and more tactical. The code gets more and more complex and a more and more difficult place to work until even the smallest change is now terrifying and slow and almost sure to introduce new bugs to an already buggy system. The problem here is that we need to prioritize work based on a balance of things. We need people who understand user need and make sure that technical teams don't go off on some technical masturbation dream. And we need people who understand the design and the technology to make sure that the business focus doesn't lead us into a pit of unmaintainable crap. Avoiding both of these extremes is firmly in everybody's interest. The problem is that balancing decisions like this to avoid these extremes is rather tricky. And the ability to do it is rarely embodied in a single person and so it needs a collaborative approach. This is almost never going to work well if the technologists or the business decide priorities alone. Build the most valuable stuff for the user first is a very good guideline, but only makes sense in combination with some other ideas. The huge one, the vital one, for this to work is that technical teams take responsibility for the accidental complexity. We're the expert in software and computers. We are best placed to understand which parts of the accidental complexity are actually essential for our goals, but these changes aren't the same kind of thing as user stories. Forgive me, but I think that part of the problem here is just how bad so many teams are at user stories. A user story is meant to express a user need, a small increment in the function of a system that will be of some use to a user from their perspective. It's not meant to be a work item or a task for a development team. It's more like a target that the team will work towards and aim to achieve as a result. To achieve that goal, there will usually be lots of different steps, 
including work on both the essential and accidental complexities of the system. If we see user stories as defining a series of programming by remote kind of step, decided by someone outside the development team, we're now in a low quality game. If we go down this road and start to decompose work into a series of tasks, inevitably some of these tasks will be technical ones. Whether we call all of these things user stories, they are not, or technical stories, they aren't that either, it doesn't really matter. The problem is, how does anyone prioritise work like this? How do we evaluate the relative merits of pay by credit card versus add column X to the database or make this button blue? We can't. Different people will see these th things differently and for good reason, they are different. We're comparing apples and frogs here. They're categorically different kinds of change. What usually happens is someone, often a manager of some kind, takes on the responsibility of prioritising things because someone has to. They don't really like it much. It's pretty stressful making choices about things that you don't really understand, but they'll do it anyway. Now they've got two choices. They either deprioritise the stuff that they don't really understand the importance of, or they trust somebody else to make the priority calls on the stuff that they don't really understand. If it's done collaboratively between people who trust each other and work well together, the second approach can work. But to be honest, in my experience, the first approach is much more common. And this never really works. Unless the person doing the deciding understands the whole system in detail, the technic technical and business needs, and often, even when they do think that they do that, they're fooling themselves. Even in the first case, that does work, this is still not the best approach. Because how do you decide which is more important? Credit card payment versus the database column. So in my view, technical stories are a cop-out. They mean that the teams are either trying to abdicate responsibility wanting someone else to make the call so that if they're wrong it isn't the dev team's fault, even though this is really their responsibility and their sphere of expertise, or people outside the dev team are trying to exert control where either they're not qualified to do so or are not close enough to the problem and the code to make good choices. As a result, I think it's a much better strategy to eliminate technical stories altogether. All work should be focused on user stories instead. This might sound even worse to you. What? We're going to give all evil managers free reign to create feature factories? No, that's not what I'm talking about. The other side of this approach is that the tech teams accept the responsibility for technical decision making and the prioritisation of technical work. We nearly always do this to some degree anyway. We don't usually need user stories to tell us to store stuff in a database or write it to a file. If you do have user stories like that, you're probably doing it wrong in the way that I described earlier. User stories are about user needs, not solutions. If all of our prioritisation is done on the basis of user need, it's easier to decide what takes precedence and what can wait. So what about the technical stuff, all that additional complexity that we've taken out of our plans now? Well, I think this is best treated in two different categories. First, a lot of the accidental complexity is simply the cost of doing development well. Designing good code that's maintainable and continues to be so has a direct commercial impact on the organisation that employ us. I believe that the sustained repeatable ability to change our code at any time when we learn something new, like the need for a new feature that we hadn't thought of before, is the defining characteristic of high quality code. We shouldn't need to wait for someone else to tell us every possible failure case that we need to cover. We should think about how our code can go wrong and design for mitigations for those failures as part of the features that we're asked to deliver. This is us applying our professional experience and our duty of care to our work. It is in everyone's interest, commercial or technology, to keep our code in good order. We shouldn't ask for permission to do these things from anyone. 
We should do it all of the time. This isn't a free pass for over-engineering, but we care about and improve the design in the areas of the code that we're working in, refactoring it when something changes our view on our design, maintaining it so it fits our mental model of the problem and the system as we go. This is not a luxury. This is how you go faster. The research from the Dora Group and their State of DevOps reports says that there's no trade-off between speed and quality. The Iron Triangle is a myth. In fact, it's the reverse. If you want to go fast, you must have high quality. And if you want high quality, you need to move fast and make progress in small steps. When you do this, the data says that the team will spend 44% more of its time on new features. That's a commercial win for everyone. This is true of things like writing tests, refactoring, and trying out and discussing design ideas. None of this needs to be presented as an option or a planning choice. You shouldn't need to track this stuff separately in JIRA or on timesheets, or surface it for debate with anyone outside the team. This is all just development as usual, in my opinion. There's another category of this accidental complexity stuff, though, that does need different treatment. This is the stuff that will take more time and effort, and is often seen as another form of technical story. Stuff like scaling up your system to handle more users, speeding it up to improve its responsiveness, or perhaps making it more fault tolerant. These are technical changes in how the system works in response to changes in the business, perhaps. The problem with these kinds of change is that they often cross boundaries between more regular features and so feel somewhat different to them. Actually, I think this category of technical sto stories are really just another category of user stories. I want the results of my orders back quickly so that I can understand what I've just ordered. Or, or I'd like to carry on placing orders even when there's a meteorite strike on my local data center. Inside every technical story, there's user value struggling to escape. We just need to think of a way of letting it out. Now we can prioritize sensibly credit card payments, or handling meteorite disasters. Uh, once we identify the real user need that sits behind our technical stories, we can treat them the same way as any other, juggling priorities in conversation with non-technical people and breaking our stories down into smaller chunks so that we can develop them and maybe even release them in smaller, safer steps. My team once designed and developed a multi-data center messaging and clustering system with full disaster recovery and predictable minimal data loss for our exchange. We did this over a period of a month or two, as I recall, released progressively in a series of tiny steps. We got to see each step in production and learn from it as we grew its capabilities. Each step added some form of user value, and that's how we organized and planned all the work. There are sometimes gray areas. What's the user value of updating the version of C-sharp that your system uses? I think there are, there are two solutions to this part of the problem. You either make it so easy to do the task that you can do it without the need to schedule it. You just roll it in alongside feature development. Or you identify the user value as before. As a user, I want to minimize the chances of being hacked so this version of C-sharp is better. You can make even broad brush changes like this easy. Updating C-sharp should be easy. If your deployment and configuration management is automated and you make the update every time there's a new version of the language, that's easy. The longer you leave it between updates, the harder it gets to update. If you really can't find a user need, why did you want to make the change in the first place? The real secret here is to do all of this in small steps all the time, rather than waiting until you're playing catch up. If you are working on legacy code and you are playing catch up though, things are a little different. I'd still adopt the approach that I've already recommended for all new work, but being pragmatic, now you may need to surface some of these tech stories. This is not the best way to organize work in general, but you're already in a mess, so you, you're going to need to stabilize. The game here is in gaining enough agreement to do the remedial work. I recommend that you adopt the Boy Scout rule. Always leave the code in a better state after every commit uh, to start the process of improvement. 
Aim to make the parts of the code where you are working a habitable space. Maybe keep a little list of tidy ups that the team would like to do when they hit that part of the code. Then aim to catch any technical debt repayments that you can't cover this way in terms that non-techies can understand. Try once again to find the real user story if you can. As a last resort, as a tech exercise, make a list of the big ticket items of technical work that you want to do and to make things better. Then go through it and prioritize it, ruling out the ideas that you can't defend in terms of business value. Maybe track the dev time wasted because of the problems that you'd like to fix over a period of a week or two. Now you have a stronger case to make as to why these things matter and should be done. Thank you very much for watching.